Yeah, I come from a long line of mumblers. <laughs> you're, in, you stick, you're in good company, though. Yeah. I don't remember this table in here from like four years this ago. This is all, well, I think the last time you came up here and uh, interviewed me, the other room. Was oh, the, <clears throat> it was a smaller. Oh, apartment. that's something like this. Right. And you had books in that. Is this still the library? Yes, yeah, still the library. Where I oh, okay. Very good. How long have you been here, by the way? Here being Since vague. 2009. Oh, okay. Uh, meaning Washington Heights, New York. Yeah. Uh huh. Right. Yeah, I moved back here from Berlin in, two th- in June 2009. Right. Oh, right. Okay. Well, we're happy to have you back. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're nice welcome. To be back. And you were so nice. You you really gave me all that time, and uh, it was kind of much much earlier on. I, I sucked back then. Then. <laughs> <laughs> and then because of the release of uh, that won't fly. The, oh, I'll uh, stop. No, no. I, I, well, you can do it. Just not when we're talking. I'll get it. Like you, I'll totally stop, and then you can do it because then I can cut it out. Uh, but uh, fourth cup of coffee today. Is it true? This is you on four cups. Mm. You're you're still not even yeah. at, at pre. Well, I had a nap too, so that's <laughs> okay. But when you were releasing um, Ned Rifle, it was it was it was sometime before that, and also My America. Right, I think it was around My America. Yeah, yeah, right. And then we did a thing with um, with Ted, and then down at the movie theater. Yeah, yeah, and uh, where you did a screening. Mm-hmm. That's right. It's all coming back. And then at South by, and but that was that a pleasant experience, the whole South by thing for you? Of oh, that's the, right. We talked at South by for know, a minute. That it hallway. was so rushed. Yeah, yeah it wasn't really. Um, yeah, that was uh, good. I had never been to South by. It was a lot. Thank you. Mm-hmm. you know, it's what I expect. A lot of the American festivals just seem to be so incredibly. Um, I, I like that they're monetized. It's about advertising your. Oh, film, okay. mm-hmm. getting it sold or distributed in some right. way. I like that. And I like talking to journalists and, you know, getting the word out about it. Uh-huh. Um, but it's just an aggression uh, at the American festivals. <laughs> That's, That's a lot. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, it was, it was the self help thing. You know, this. The what? What is it? It's almost like a self help thing. Oh, okay. It's like, as long as you pay the money. Right. You know. Oh. To be at the meeting, yeah, you can, you know, mm-hmm. show us your film. I mean, it's just. It's. it's I shouldn't it, say it, this on the radio. It's actually. okay. Yeah. It's all right. No, but 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 w- w- I can make it sound great. But it's uh, it's, it's I see what you're saying. So it's 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 okay. capitalism. Yeah. Yes. Right. It's a cap- It's capitalism at its most predictable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I guess we could say that the reason we're getting together today, in large part, although you know, uh, thrilled to, to to talk to you anytime, of course, because uh, you know, um, I think not only my love, love your films, but a lot of people that listen to this. When I put put something up on social media about pre pre order pre order the box set, the mm-hmm. new box set, which is what we're gonna talk about. Um, I got a lot of you know people ex- excited that that you're coming back on the the podcast so excellent so i as i said in my email i don't care it's nothing to do with me if you don't want to come on that's fine and i could care less you know what i mean it's for them you're just disappointed you don't see <laughs> okay i mentioned the box set the henry fool trilogy which i know you've been it's been in the works or in the planning stages for a long time right since yes. well since you released Ned rifle well really it, it began when i decided that i would write a second part you know so it was early as 2000, 2001, I started thinking that we would write a Henry Fool Part 2. Um, Fake would, Rim. Which... which would be called Fake Rim. Um, I had toyed with that for years. Uh, we made Henry Fool in 1997. Right. And then it premiered at Cannes in 1998. And so through 98, 99, 2000, you know, I was toying with this idea, and I was talking to Parker about it. Okay. Which he... Want to do Faye again, but you know, we would do another uh family grim story, except right. it would be about kind of her. And uh, she was really excited about that because she loved that character. And when I wrote Henry Fool, Faye very much on the page feels like a supporting player, uh, but she 
really just you know played a great game and and the character became so much more central mm -hmm. even without me writing more scenes or anything like that uh it was also the first time i'd ever been able to work with parker at length mm -hmm. <clears throat> she had been in a couple of other she things. had been in little pieces in in flirt before that and a little piece in surviving desire and um but we had never really had an opportunity to work deeply and develop a character. And it was really one of the best experiences I had had in the movie business to that point. So I really wanted to work with her again. Um, but when I decided uh, that I would definitely do a part two of Henry Fool, I knew there would have to be a part three because I'm that way. I'm just kind of a classicist. Uh -huh. That way it's got to be <laughs> three acts or, it's, you know, it would have it seemed unbalanced it was, if it was just like Henry and Faye mm -hmm. because there's so much more of the family. There's Simon and, mm -hmm. and their son. And so early on, I decided that I'm going to write part two, and then part three is in the offing, and it's going to be named after their son, mm -hmm. Ned. <clears throat> um, now, at the time, I didn't know what would happen with... Liam Aiken, who plays, yeah, who originated Ned as a five-year-old in in Fagrim, in in Henry Fool, he was five. He was oh okay. okay, yeah, and then so he didn't have such a huge role in Fagrim, but I called him, and I'm friendly with his mother and him, and he was about sixteen, I think, when we made Fagrim, and that so. was shot in. Europe too, isn't it? Wasn't uh, it? All over the place. Fagrim was shot. It was, in, it was international intrigue at, they, its, at yeah. its most uh, robust. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I, I, but it was shot abroad as well, so it might have been mm -hmm. a little bit more kind of complicated. It was. It was a bigger film. Fagrim is a very large film. Yeah, I mean, it was shot in five countries on four continents, and um, yeah. Uh, Anyway, so it was the, the whole thing about making a trilogy had to do with that. Like, if I make a part two, I know I'm going to have to make a part three, but I still don't know if this young man wants to grow up to be an actor. So there was always the opportunity of <clears throat> casting someone else to play Ned when we finally got there. Sure. But we didn't have to, uh, because uh, even when we made Faye Grimm and Liam Aiken was... 16 at the time I asked him so you're going to continue this uh, acting thing <laughs> you're, you're planting seeds well he he had a, he had a very good um, career as a child actor he oh, did, so he got did a lot of work okay. uh, and some really large films and stuff uh, but you know he was 16 he was thinking of going to college and now and he didn't know maybe he'd be a director or maybe he wanted to go study writing or something but he was grandfathered into your trilogy yeah, he was, so he was grandfathered into it <laughs> and um, I had to make and I, t I was honest with him I said uh, if I make this part two and you come to Europe to be in it mm -hmm. you know I'm definitely going to write a part three and it's going to be about your character um, I, no pressure I just yeah. want you to know about that. <laughs> and, um, but he was kind of a, a typical 16 year old at that point, the way he should be. He was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, however, just mm -hmm. hanging out with him in this coffee shop, I saw what I recognized as, uh, charisma. And so I put my money on the fact that, you know, by the time he's 20, see what happens so um yeah i saw him a couple of years later and he was this handsome Strapping young man, young man of yeah course, and, right. uh, who was really dedicated to his craft really where did he go did he go to study no i oh, don't good. think he studied anywhere he just uh, yeah. watched movies and he was on set all through his right. childhood so sure sure he, he saw of, some of the probably a lot of really great prose right in action right yeah and he, he just listened and mm -hmm. you know. yeah yeah uh, so there it is. Now it's all done. Uh, and uh, now the other complicated thing, the, the big adventure, was that Henry Fool, the rights to Henry Fool finally came back to me last year. They're mine now. That film belongs to me. Nobody else. Great. There's one or two small licenses existing out there in the world somewhere. But uh, so I took the original materials and I created uh for the first time, high definition materials, 
and uh, you know, renovated the whole film and stuff like that. Did you go to a third party? Yeah, you go to. We did the work here at Post Factory here in New York, which mm-hmm. is a company that I believe the Cohen brothers are mm-hmm. owners of. Is Cohen. that right? Um, it's a great place. A couple of really talented technicians and and you know, what they call IT artists and, and you know they get rid of scratches and stuff yeah. in the original. Right. Um, and they worked very uh, well with us. So I had that and um, Ned Rifle, of course. I own completely. I could do what I want with that. It was Faye Grimm, which I made for another company, uh, which owns the rights. I don't own anything in that. So, But they hadn't really done that much with it over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they tried when it came out and they met a certain amount of opposition, didn't get the kind of reviews they wanted. Whatever. So um, anyway, it just kind of like sat there and mm-hmm. went nowhere. <clears throat> and a lot of my fan base around the world have always been asking about it, saying, like, it never came to Poland, it never came to France, it never came to... You're, and you're just talking about theatrically, or you're talking about even in, in other any formats? Yeah. Just zero, right? Yeah. Did it, what, did it have a DVD or something like that, or no, streaming just, or anything? Just, no, it's it never just been went available. nowhere. Here in uh, North America, it was on um, DVD. Okay. Yeah. However, so um, I started the conversation years ago with... Uh, the company who owns it. And I said, why don't you just let me, you know, distribute it? Anyway, they wouldn't allow me to do that. Uh, But then once I had Henry Full and Ned Rifle, it was a different kind of thing. And I'd spoke to uh, the people I know over there at Magnolia Mm -hmm. Pictures. And um, And they're the ones that... uh, Yeah, Eamon Bowles over at... Eamon, yeah. Eamon said, yeah, just probably will work so um, so that he saw that there was some more there was yeah that that the perhaps it's a, it's a way of embe- exploiting the film in some manner right uh and this i think is really the best way to do it have all three films together oh yeah they're all designed the same and in presentation they're all presented the same you can really feel you can really see immediately how mm-hmm. it all ties together right um so I hope that it brings a lot more attention to Faye Grimm, which is a film I'm very proud of that uh, okay. didn't really get distributed that much. What was the deal with um, with Ned Rifle? That was... That, uh, Ned Rifle? Yeah. It has always been owned by me. You always owned it. So it was always yeah. possible films. Yeah. Right? Which is your, your own production company and right. distribution company now, right? Yeah. It's a, yeah, there's no difference really anymore right. between that kind yeah. of thing. Um, yeah. I remember thinking we always follow the music business. The movie business always tends to follow the. Movie. But I remember at a certain point, like getting a, one of the later David Bowie CDs, and just like, who, there's no distributor on here. There's no record. You know, he's yeah. always be whoever it is. And it was well, Warner Brothers or whatever. Or so, then it yeah. became even for a while because I was working at Sony, uh, so it was right, like Columbia. Then. He was his last right. big distribution was through Columbia. I think. Yeah. But I'm, um, I'm I'm I'm, uh, cla- I'm sinking my sink, sinking my uh, sipping to yours. So yeah, um, Ned Rifle, I was able to do a Kickstarter campaign, mm-hmm. raise money to make the film. Then we made the film, and then I made uh, some short-term license deals to distributors around the world. Um, and then I made a, a nice deal with uh, Cinedyne. Mm-hmm. Um, who handle, they're my digital distributor, essentially, my, mm-hmm. my agent for digital distri- distribution. And they made a good deal with Netflix for that film. So um, it was kind of a small budgeted film, but it's really done pretty well for itself. Yeah. So you, you got uh, Clay, no, you got Liam, to, that's a different Aiken, I guess. You got Liam Aiken to do the, did he even know that he would be starring opposite Audrey Plaza? That Ned, Ned Rifle film? Did he have? Uh, did no, they, he didn't. You, that was I, almost like a reward for agreeing to do it without knowing that. Like this is I just what, just agreeing to do it. I'm rewarding you so you can be. <laughs> he work. was. Um, I I don't see him that often around that time uh, because he lives in Los Angeles. But uh-huh. we would call, we would text each other, and he knew the whole thing was going on. He was like, you know, he was really. Uh, assisted us in the Kickstarter campaign. You know, I flew a crew out to L.A. to film them for an afternoon. You know, he did some 
testimonials and stuff like that and uh-huh. spoke to camera and you know whatever was needed to help you know make it a fancier sexier kickstarter oh, campaign right. you know? sure. right. so um it was all great but we i hadn't actually been in the same room with them for, for years you know we were just talking on the telephone about this mm-hmm. and one day i said hey well uh, looks like Aubrey Plaza is going to play Susan. <laughs> he was like, cool. <laughs> that's, all, that's all he said. Um, he's like, great. No, but and then when he finally came here and they met, they were like hilarious to be together. They have a very funny, mm-hmm. um, yeah, teasing kind right. of uh, relationship together. Mm-hmm. But they had never met or anything like, out there in L.A. Uh, yeah, so that was a very happy... Uh, Happy turnout. Yeah. Well. Um, so what went? So you you already mentioned you you restored, and uh, I guess what do you call it? Um, upgraded? No, that's not the right word. Well, well you, you now have a, a, a high definition version of Henry Fool. Yeah, Henry I mean, Fool had I'm never. Been. Ned is always. Yeah, that was shot. In high that definition. was shot. Yeah, so right. was Faye Grimm was shot in high definition. But oh, I meant to ask you one thing. I'm sorry, and then I'm sorry to interrupt. But you, when you did, when you said you sent, you sort of arranged short term licensing for Ned Rifle, right? Distribution wise, knowing that you wanted it back pretty quick, it sounds like. Did you? Consider- uh, yeah, I was open to any kind of uh, deal at the time, okay. but I. It's the it's the way the business mm. for smaller independent films anyway. Sure, sure. Uh, the license terms are. Shorter. There's mm-hmm. not much money if there is any money. Mm-hmm. Um, I refuse to do anything without any money. So uh, there were a f- couple of things here in the United States mm-hmm. uh, with Vimeo and then in uh, Malaysia and uh, right, no, no. Poland. There was one. Um, and a lot of it was TV mm-hmm. too, it wasn't theatrical. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was great. I mean, it paid for the film. Um, oh, great. So that was good. Mm. Uh, I just wonder if you wanted it to revert. Because so maybe this was a great way to really to put the movies out there. Ultimately, like in a, yeah. In a box so it would make sense. You'd want it back pretty... You didn't want it to yeah, worry I didn't, about the tangling up in that hole. Right. I don't want any more to have the rights to my films out with anyone else. Yeah. And do you, it, will Magnolia ever expire in terms of? Uh, no, my it, I'm whatever money comes in from this. Once we pay off the cost of making it, right? Uh, you know what? One third of it goes to Magnolia. Goes to Magnolia. And, but does that deal expire at some point? Never. No, they, just, they have that for. They own it for. It's theirs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what were we, we going to say? Oh, so yeah, I was going to ask you just about the work that went into. So it sounds like that. It sounds like Henry Fool required. The most work to get it to where you wanted yeah. it to be for this. Yeah. Because um, it's the oldest film, and you shot it. Yeah, we went back to the original um, interpositive, as you call it, back uh-huh. in the day. Yep. Um, Scan, you know, yeah. and it, it's, you know, it's, it's old. And also, just, um, it wasn't in such bad shape. There were certain reels. A feature film of that length is about six reels. And a couple of the reels had gotten banged up somewhere along the line, scratches in them. <clears throat> and... Uh, However, when you're turning that kind of physical 35 millimeter motion picture into data, mm-hmm. um, there's a lot you can do. Mm-hmm. It's, I was very impressed with the the technicians and the artists who could paint out those scratches frame by frame and all that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's never looked better. <laughs> That's what, Henry Fool has never looked better yeah, than it, it looks again. now. And... Um, Faye Grimm also had never been distributed uh, with its uh, proper uncompressed 5.1 mix. Um, so we were able to do that. Uh, so all three films that were really in the presentation that they were intended right. to be. So they all look and sound as good as they can be. You know? Yeah, and the way you want them. Yeah. They're up to your standards. That, you know. Yeah, this will be... Um, I'm reaching over mm-hmm. for the pop thing right now. Um yeah, this will be the first of the whole library. That's the aim now, is to get all of my films released through us, through possible films. It'll be presented in similar ways, so it's, it'll be a library. Mm-hmm. Some of those other films that you're referring to, uh, the pre-trilogy, <laughs> the pre-trilogy yeah. films, rather. Yeah, this one was a tall order. I mean, in a different kind of universe, I would have decided to go out with just one film at once, you know, because... 
is it, that is a nice way to introduce this, your whole a plan though right think, you know? but you know we're doing this in five different languages too so each one of these films yeah, and the documentary right. that's attached to it is subtitled in five different languages i know that's a massive amount of work you know to to rally all these people who are doing the translation and then once the translation's done then the actual subtitling itself in different countries different languages have you know it, it's taken a year did you yeah just that phase you mean just the phase of the subtitling yeah yeah and just making sure it's it looks who, right do you hire somebody to kind of just handle that whole or you're well or... christopher mcchain in the next room he's yeah. the producer. Uh, producer of this whole package so uh he was in charge of our various vendors um there are manufacturing vendors but right. uh, there's also um we have ambassadors in each country now. Yeah. <laughs> of a French ambassador to possible films, uh, Matthew Germain, who's in Paris. Oh. He Germain. Has, Germain, yeah. That's his name. He has been my French uh, translator yeah. for a couple of films now. Um, so he's our guy in Paris, and he, so he did the subtitling there. Um, and then we have uh, a company in Berlin uh, named Alias, who... Uh, did a number of different uh, languages for us for the documentary. Um, we wasted a whole bunch of money with some other company in Boston to do the Japanese before we finally just said, all right, f forget it. Let's go to Tokyo. Right. So we uh, we have an ambassador in Tokyo, you're Akira. Big in, you're big in Japan, right? <laughs> I used to be big. It's like everywhere, like in France. You know. I mean, the early 90s. My, my first three films were big yeah. in those territories. And then... No I one followed the other films not much at all. Um, so I'm interested now in like bringing. We're very happy about the uh, Kickstarter campaign. Is that the, the major places where people kick started from yeah. was the United States and Japan. Oh, um, and a lot of that has to do with our ambassador in Tokyo, Akira, who worked really hard to get people's attention about this and people's like you mean Hal Hartley from Trust and right. uh, Simple Men and Simple Men and yeah, said, yeah it was, these are three films he made later and they're all a uh, trilogy and, la, la, la. and the people in Japan just really got on board wow. and were really interested love that story so um, we're very happy now and we're already it, it led to more uh, TV distribution of some of the other films in uh, Tokyo right now so we're looking forward to that. But I think the next step of this, after the Henry Fool trilogy, will probably, the next one most likely will be Trust, mm -hmm. all by itself. Mm -hmm. Subtitled oh. in five languages. Yeah. You know, with a book and all that. Just like these. Uh, I'm sure you had a conversation, though, that sounded a lot like, do we do this other loose trilogy together, like the, the first three, right? We're no, we're like, still actually having that conversation. I guess you could still, yeah, it's another we, way. Yeah, back no. It, Chris McChain's idea is that, um, yeah, if we were going... Long, they sometimes call it the Long Island trilogy. Right. Like it, he said, as a fan, that's how you it was perceived. So it would probably be a very satisfying you know, product for mm -hmm. a fan if there was the unbelievable truth, trust, and simple man all in one box. Set that's like why I, I would feel that way, too. Yeah. Like right, the, yeah. Like the Lindenhurst uh, trilogy, whatever you want to call it. Except I still have some. I'd have to do some more legal wrangling. Um, uh, the unbelievable truth has some um, license issues. I'd have to sew up. Um, but then on the other hand, I was just I'm so knocked out right now from doing this mm, I bet. trilogy thing in five different languages, in three different formats, in Blu-ray. DVD for the North America and DVD for Europe. I mean, it's it was just incredibly um, complicated. Is Blu-ray one format uh, international? Yeah. Oh, it is. Oh, that's yeah. good. I know it's a lovely thing, but makes streaming seem even that much more attractive though. At the end, mm. <laughs> as a result. Yeah. It, what, speaking of which, is that something? Also, can you stream this new restored? Um, no, not uh, okay. just yet. Right. Um, we may another. Uh, countries sony pictures classics still has the streaming rights for henry fool for like five six years now so complicated right yeah you have to keep track of all this stuff yeah see what people out there and 
you know, the ether oh, that are they out there. They don't care about all that stuff. Yeah, they, don't they don't need, need to, to know. know about it anyway. No. Yeah, but I get a lot of people, like, in the film world listening, and that might right. be cons- interested. And also, film students, you know, that I try to do a lot of outreach now to film schools mm. because I figure, like, your, your tales will scare off a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we're talking to Hal Harley about uh, the new Henry Fool box set the Henry Fool Trilogy box set, I should say, which will be out, I guess, after, already. It, it was released on February 19th. We're I'm pretending that it's already come out. Cause yeah, that went, February 19th. I'll put this up so people can already order. I mean, they could re-pre-order, but, yeah, but, I, yeah, but people can order right off, off of your website. This uh, is for later in the month, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I so guess I could, I could put up before, if you guys prefer it, I'll put it up. You know, I could put up before no, the 19th. Until my, I mean, I could put up a special episode. It's available... Technically, it's actually available now, okay. the thirteenth. Uh, but um, you're, you're, it starts. Kind of the advertising the magic of the podcast. Yeah. The advertising starts on Monday, the nineteenth, mm-hmm. and it's available on Amazon everywhere. You know, in, mm-hmm. you, if but you're you French, to... you can shop in French on Amazon and buy it on Amazon or Germany or or Japan. 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 What was the fifth country? Spain. Spain. Don't leave Spanish off Spain. You, you haven't mentioned the ones. Mm. Uh, Barcelona? Is that where you're... Do you have uh, an ambassador in Barcelona? No, we do have a part-time Spanish language ambassador. Okay. <laughs> but he's a busy young man who splits his time between Paris and Mexico City. Oh. And he's going to college. He's going to stuff. Okay. Um, but one way or another, it was really hard to penetrate the Spanish language world about these things. I mean, I know I had in the 90s a, a big fan base in Spain, but it, it was just hard. Like, um, you learn a lot of things when you do the Kickstarter. I'm sure you've done your own Kickstarter. You you know, you look at those demographics and you're like, look at this. 90% of these people are English speaking. Okay, I understand that. I'm an English speaking filmmaker. I understand that. But then all of a sudden there's this big percentage in mm-hmm. Japan and no one in Spain. But, you know, Mm. With all of my films during the 90s and early 2000s, I always went to Spain to do publicity. So th- there was always a sizable audience. But one way or the other, and it might just be my own uh, uh, need to work harder at uh, figuring it out, but you know, I, I've got to make more um, publicity okay. contacts in Spain, well, in the Spanish-speaking right. world. Well, frankly, you know, it's funny because I, what I found is is that uh, it, it does help you, the Kickstarter, on a, 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 on a personal level because you do find out things like that which really do help you. Now you know what sort of like it gives you clues to all this information that you know you may not even thought of going into the Kickstarter that you, you now know. So I found out also information about my listenership and all sorts of stuff that's very helpful. You know? Yeah. I used, I've said this a number of times now because I've done a Kickstarter three times, but you used to like make your movie and then you would market it. Whereas right. when you're doing a crowdsourcing thing, you're actually doing the marketing first yeah. to find out who's going to see your movie yeah, or, or right. potential marketing. How should you make this movie? Right. Um, so you learn uh, really who your audience is. And for the most part, like with the very sizable uh, Ned Rifle Kickstarter we did. How much was that you were trying to raise? It was $380,000. Jesus. And yeah. uh, you really find out who your fans are, like the real fans, you know, the fans who are willing to pay right. $40 for a DVD and a CD a year in advance. Right. You know, right. Um, that's a real fan, <laughs> people who are really interested in your work. So um, once you have that information, you can build upon it, just stay mm-hmm. in touch with those people. Right. And, and yeah. it kind of spreads. But now I understand why you didn't want to mention Spain, where you're, that wasn't such a big part, because there's nobody <laughs> out there. It falls on deaf ears so far, but now you... Kind of, I don't think... I think it's not that uh, the ears are deaf out there. I think I just didn't get to them. One, I've got to figure out how to get the word out in Spain and Mexico and other parts yeah, in right. Central and South America, where you know, to say, like, hey, these films are available subtitled in Spanish. That'll make a big deal. So, mm-hmm. you know... Mm-hmm. You know what that is? Is just sitting at your computer, writing emails mm-hmm. and getting introduced to people and asking people, you know, who's that? 
short of uh, sometimes you, you have to just bite the bullet and spend money on a local publicist mm-hmm. who can initiate those contacts. Yeah, <laughs> right. Try to get a little bit of a get get this into maybe some uh, uh, fan websites and and uh, or well, we're curious and, to see how it's going to work with uh, Amazon mm-hmm. too because for for the first time we've really set up Amazon globally as a as a global seller. Um, you know, if you were in Madrid shopping in Spanish, you could shop in Spanish on Amazon and find the Henry Fool trilogy box set. You can find that page there, and it's in Spanish, and you can hey, buy The transaction is all right in Spanish, yeah. as opposed to having to go through the American portal or whatever it is. Right, the, or and it's the cheap right. shipping thing. Like, uh, Oh, right. If it was just HalHartley.com was the only place and somebody in Spain would have to spend whatever it is $99 to buy the box set or whatever that is in euros but mm-hmm. then they'd have to spend like another $30 to get it shipped from New York to, to Madrid right <clears throat> so uh, we wanted to avoid that mm-hmm. um, it's so yeah that could be disincentivizing you know. or whatever the word right yeah 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 so as this conversation indicates you know you you're not only a writer and a director, you're a right. marketing analyst and you're a, you know, a salesperson. Yeah. But at the end of the all. day, understanding your audience and who they are and, you know, it's it's not a bad thing necessarily. It's just no. that you could be doing something else during that time or that, right. you know, that's that's the thing, right? Yeah. And I do. I spend most of my time doing something else. Christopher McChain really runs this whole operation. Operation, yeah. Creatively speaking, uh, not that this wasn't a creative process. I'm, I, you know, I always think about how much of that is considered creative or, or not. It's certainly not artistic, restoring a film, but it's it's a craft. It's a uh, oh uh, yeah. I mean, these uh, these are artisans, if not artists. So absolutely, and you know, so they they have to be very technical. These uh, sure right um, people who they got like for instance, the gentleman who was correcting. Henry Fool is young enough that he's never worked in motion pictures. So he had a lot of questions to ask me. He's like, that is a strange scratch. What is that? I said, yeah, that's a scratch. But that's not a scratch. This other thing here is a piece of the um, the bath, the, the chemicals that they use to develop the negative has, has kind of splashed or something like that. And you would never have seen that back in the in 1997 uh-huh. when we made these prints right um but now our eyes oh as yeah viewers has become so acute mm-hmm. yeah we, yeah, we're so accustomed to accustomed. a perfectly glass-like serene image <clears throat> yeah that uh things like these are are a problem it's a real uh, pain in the ass too to be frank <laughs> well yeah with distributors around the world like I'm going through this right now. This Japanese company wants to license three of the films for a short term for TV. Yeah, you know, so I'm sending them this high definition file, mm-hmm. which is in very good shape of these three films. Mm-hmm. But I know they're going to come back and say it's imperfect. That's oh. that they will say. I had this last year in France. To, you know, it's like uh, um, the uh, the frame jolts just a tiny bit at this edit here. I'm like, yeah, that's because the, it's an edit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like in the old days, that's the edit, yeah. which is a physical thing, yeah. which bumps through very slightly as it goes through the gate of the movie projector. Yeah, right. That's how it was. Yeah. You ever now, see something by, you ever watch Godard, by the way? I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> <laughs> but these days they expect you to fix Right. Every that single one of them. Implying that it, it was a um, some sort of it's a mistake. mistake or something. Right. You uh, say, no, it's not a mistake. That's how it's intended. Yeah. Uh, now, if that's the kind of filmed entertainment which you don't want, then let's <laughs> just another stop negotiating. <laughs> yeah. I noticed in Faye Grimm, some, something's wrong with your camera angles. <laughs> <laughs> you actually did make mistakes in that movie, right? The ones that weren't. There was would, only one. Sarah Collier, oh, one DP, said that there was one. We're, t- we're referring to Dutch angles. Yeah, there was one is... Dutch angle where it went from one 
what we call left-leaning Dutch angle to another left-leaning Dutch angle, where we had. But well, you don't want to do that. We always. It, it doesn't matter okay. at all, um, because none of them are always at the same degree anyway. So mm. it's uh, no. Uh, in those days, that was the early two thousands. I was doing that a lot. The girl from Monday is a lot of Dutch angle shooting and um, Faye Grimm and a lot of my shorter mm. uh, works, like <laughs> in uh, PF two. And that okay. came. I think it really started because I was starting in the late '90s working with standard definition video a lot, Book of Life, and all that. Um, mm-hmm. These very small cameras. It kind of came out of that having a camera in my hands that's the size of this bottle of water. Mm. You kind of don't think theatrically. You don't think proscenium. Mm-hmm. level you kind of look at everything tilted and I like that and also there were two films The Girl from Monday and Faye Grimm are uh, they sort of embrace a genre type in one case uh, science fiction and in the other uh, espionage thriller so I wanted it to be fun they were also both movies of uh there's a lot of ideas mm-hmm. thrown at you pretty quickly, mm-hmm. um, which I liked and wanted, but I also wanted the film to be fun. So I wanted the audience to know right off the bat that, you know, right, this is not deadly serious, right? You don't have to, you know, you don't have to start crying immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, you know, furrow your brow. Exactly. Um, your there's chin. a lot of ideas here, but, you know, you can have fun with this movie. Um, and that was one way. I just thought it was fun. Yeah. I just found it, it was interesting because I was reading up, I guess, and and they, somebody said they, 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 they were, the the mistake that maybe you forgot at one point and didn't use that Dutch angle or something, and that was unintended. So I'd have to look at that. Again you'd have to fix at this point, then. yeah, <laughs> I, because I remember being at Toronto Film Festival and Sarah saying that. Mm-hmm. And so this other stuff, though, I got was this just promotional stuff? Like, for instance, you sent a um, a CD of music. Is this music off of the soundtracks, or is, I know you're a musician, so yeah. I know you're, you've scored this. Um, After the catastrophe is my new album, oh. uh, and this was released, I believe, on December third or December ten, two thousand seventeen. You can get it on Spotify. It's all. Or... It's all. Uh, it's all Dylan covers, right? Here. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, no. It's, it's yeah. all instrumental. It's all instrumental. Yes, yeah, um, it's kind of a mix. Um, I've been working on it for about a year and a half, and uh, at first, I thought that I was going to try to make new new tunes out of melodies from all of the old films because mm-hmm. I had a lot of music here that I didn't use or mm-hmm. or the different versions and um, I wanted to make some kind of you know easy easy listening music <laughs> stuff that's kind of uh, beat driven uh, rock you know lighter rock mm-hmm. stuff that's uh, appropriate for cafes and restaurants <laughs> <laughs> seriously was that in your t- you, you I, th- I think that way sure uh-huh, I think okay. that way yeah. I'm often in cafes and restaurants and think like wow the music in here is really some, good some really yeah um, yeah. So, um, anyway, so I worked on this, and so now it's a kind of a mix. Um, some kid, um, trust me, Ballad of Simple Men. There's three out of the 11 cuts that are really built on music from my older films. But everything else is kind of new, mm-hmm. uh, made over the last couple of years. How is it available? Or you you can it? get that on Pandora or Spotify. Okay. Uh, you can buy it from CD Baby or from us at halhartley.com. Mm-hmm. A bunch of them there. Okay. Um, so, so in yeah. other words, but it's in, okay. So it's it's an independent. It's on its own. You, you yeah. order on the side. Again, it's called After the Catastrophe. And uh, what catastrophe does it refer? Uh, uh, I think it, it refers it in the- some way refers to the presidential uh, election. Okay, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you, I don't know what you're talking about. The American president? Mm. Okay, yeah, that's good. The second track is "Ballad of a Simple Man." 
which or no, excuse me, Ballad of Simple Men. Yeah, but it could have been Sam Ballad of a Simple Man. Yeah, that's a, an example of anyone who knows Simple Man or, yeah. or knows the music I made at that point um, mm-hmm. would recognize it. It's just it's a different way of arranging that kind of music. Sure. The and then there's the, this book, but this was this is just this is also for sale. Are that you also, is, yeah, also... that will be on sale uh, okay. in various places, um, interviews, et cetera. Yeah, that's a collection. Well, we did that specifically for the Kickstarter campaign people. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, okay. That was like just... a reward. Yeah. Okay. I feel so lucky. I got all this. And the calendar, which was that. That's. Yeah, the calendar. That's available. That's also, right. And, yeah. that's, and that was also probably a reward, I'm guessing. Yeah. So that's a nice reward. So, so uh, just now that this is this is kind of on its legs, the the, the box set. What is are you other? I and I know you're looking to do the same treatment for you know that your other your older mm-hmm. films titles, but are, are you considering something new? Yeah, with that? all the time I'm usually uh, writing and developing uh, things. I'm developing a TV show, uh, which you know, keep your fingers crossed, could go right. this year. Uh, I'm in, entertaining the idea of uh, directing a feature, which David Gordon Green uh, uh-huh. brought to me. Um, oh, yeah. That's interesting collaboration. I w- might not have. Yeah, well, uh, David was one of the executive producers on Red Oaks for Amazon, which I directed a number of episodes of mm-hmm. Greg Jacobs' show, Joe Can Jimmy's show. What What was that uh, mm. platform? Or what? It's on Amazon that Prime. That? Oh, it is? Yeah. Red Oaks? Red okay. Oaks. Uh, there was three seasons. Uh, it's it very funny, uh, lovely, uh-huh. uh, you know, funny and dramatic uh, yeah. show about which takes place in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, Sounds like David Gordon Green. <laughs> yeah. Well, that might have been why him and Greg kind of hooked up on it initially. Mm-hmm. Uh, but during the first season, the 2015 season, they they approached me to do one episode. Mm-hmm. They heard that I was interested in doing TV, so they said, "Well, come on, do this." Uh, it was a great experience, and mm-hmm. then I did half of the second season. Um, you did a bunch of episodes, you mean? I did yeah. five oh, of the ten oh, wow. episodes. Yeah. Okay, and then um, are these uh, hour long episodes, or are these they are half hour thirty thirty uh, right comedy? I guess yeah, half uh-huh. hour comedy. Uh-huh. Who's in that? Oh no, it's a it's a uh, uh, just, is it a regular uh, cast or is it a uh, yeah yeah okay so uh, um, uh, Paul Reiser. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, Gina yeah. Gershon, uh, yeah. Jennifer Grey. Sure. Um, now the younger uh, folk, like uh, I Craig, Craig Roberts, is okay, the uh, star of it. Yeah. Oliver um, Cooper. Uh-huh. Yeah, just a really lovely cast. I didn't have that much to do with this main cast. I just walked in. They said, "You know, here you were for hire." Yes. Yeah, and uh, where did they shoot that? Mostly in Jersey. Uh-huh. Uh, Westchester and here in New York City. Oh, very nice for you. And yeah. then, yeah. Uh, and then, so uh, you, more, you, you enjoy the 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 uh, episodic, as they know. Uh, yeah. Well, I've been trying to get into the episodic TV thing for bro, ever since before. I came back here from Germany. Oh, yeah. Two thousand nine. Uh, it took a little while to get people to take me seriously. I think they were like, "Oh, he's an independent yeah, director. Right, right, he's right. difficult or something." Everybody's caught up now because everybody's doing. Everybody wants. Right. right. Uh, but I've written, and I was writing when I was in Germany. I was writing a lot of episodic uh-huh. TV. Uh, what was the? Things. What was the? Um, did you like the longer format for developing story and characters? Was that what was the draw to you? Or? For me, yeah, that's it. You could, you can make a five-hour-long movie, right? But it's actually ten, and half it's not considered shows. masturbatory. <laughs> in Syria, in Syria, yeah, it's more just format. boring and long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I noticed because I was the same way uh, that people watch um, their entertainment uh, on the run these days on their phones and their pads and things like that, and uh, mm-hmm. and they like them in shorter bits. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was great. It kind of mm-hmm. reminds me of novels myself. So, Back in the old days, like that's true. And, stuff yeah, like that. and it's not doesn't mean it's in place of the old. Fa- I mean, there's still tons of people running to the movie theaters, and that do love uh, story driven films. It may be a smaller population because there's just so, so much more out there, and certainly the, the 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 dollar the the distribution or rather the marketing dollars aren't going towards story driven, character driven films. Mm. Uh, but doesn't mean there aren't there isn't an appetite for it, and when, you know, so. There will always be, in yeah. other words, I think, uh, you know, a Hal Hartley audience. 
Yeah, I'm I'm more interested in the TV thing. Uh -huh. So moving towards the episode, whether it be hour or half hour uh -huh. lengths. Yeah, I've written both, um, and I still have some features uh, that I've written, but I really don't think they'll get made. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, <laughs> I hope, well. Anyway, I'm, I hope uh, to see more new work and it on, on whatever. On, One way or the other, Amazon you will see more or work, or whatever yeah. the platform is, or the pro, you know the network, whatever it is. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so it's much. Fantastic. Um, one more time, the uh, Henry Fool trilogy box set is available now, uh, either on HalHartley.com or Amazon. Wherever you are listening to this, you can get it on Amazon. Yeah. Probably in your language. Right, locally. that's right. Uh, and we'll do this again sometime. I hope. Okay. When Thanks, for you guys. Okay. Take care.